Hello, and welcome to Other Voices Online, a monthly forum and community conversation for activists. Other Voices is brought to you by Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. I'm the center's director and your host, Paul George. Thank you for joining us. June is Pride Month, a month dedicated to celebration and commemoration of LGBTQ plus pride. Pride Month began after the Stonewall Riots, a series of gay liberation protests in 1969, and has since spread far beyond the US. Pride Month both honors the movement for LGBTQ TQ rights and celebrates LGBTQ culture. I've been struck by some notable, not notable differences between the time of last year's Pride webinar and this year's. Last year, the main topic was Florida's so-called Don't Say Gay Bill, which severely restricted discussion or even mention of LGBTQ topics in Florida's schools. At the time, Florida was the center of attention as its governor, Ron DeSantis, was clearly positioning himself for a presidential run by sponsoring such legislation. But since last year, the Republican presidential field has widened considerably, and seemingly the entire party has fervently embraced attacks on the LGBTQ community as its leading policy position. In addition, Republican-dominated state legislatures around the country have been falling all over themselves in a rush to pass even more oppressive legislation, this time focused on the trans community. All of this cynical national focus on an oppressed minority seems to be resonating with a portion of the public at large, to the detriment of all. A report just released by the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, working in, conjun in conjunction with the Anti-Defamation League, documents 356 incidents of anti-LGBTQ hate and extremism over just the last 10 months. At the same time, there's been an odd evolution in the nature of political alliances nationally. Large for-profit corporations, especially those with consumer brands, have broadened their embrace of Pride Month, festooning their merchandise displays and advertising with rainbow flags throughout the month of June. As they've done so more and more each year, these corporations have come under attack by the right wing, which traditionally has fed at the trough of corporate largesse. This year, the attacks have led some of these same erstwhile corporate allies to abandon their embrace of Pride Month. So for Pride Month 2023, we're left with some profound questions. What happens when anti-Pride becomes a national campaign platform? What are the ramifications of such a thing? What does it mean for large corporations to embrace Pride and then back off when threatened by right-wingers? And as always, what can allies and activists do to protect and extend LGBTQ rights? I'm pleased to have two guests who are superbly qualified and suited to help us answer these and other questions. First, I'm very happy to welcome back Craig Wiesner, a commissioner on the San Mateo County LGBTQ Commission to which he was appointed in 2015. Craig is a co-founder of Reach and Teach Books, Toys and Gifts, a wonderful and truly unique shop in San Carlos dedicated to peacemaking, sustainable living, and inclusion that offers books, toys, and fair, fair trade gifts from around the corner and around the world. Craig has been deeply involved in social and economic justice issues and the peace movement for the last 25 years. He is married to his longtime partner, Derek Kikuchi, with whom he shares his life, business, and dog, Holly. Welcome back to Other Voices, Craig. Really nice to have you here again. Glad to be here. Thank you. And joining me for the first time is Bennett Marks, who was recommended to me by Craig, who calls Bennett an LGBTQ rights pioneer. Bennett worked as a software engineer, technical writer, and manager at Apple and Google. He has been an LGBTQ activist most of his adult life. In 1986, he founded Apple Lambda, the Apple Gay and Lesbian Employees Organization. He, along with other members, worked with Apple to create a workplace non-discrimination non policy on sexual orientation 
domestic partner benefits, and other policies for equal treatment of LGBTQ employees. He mentored and worked with employees of other Silicon Valley companies to develop similar policies at their workplaces. At Google, he was one of the founders of the Gaglers, their LGBTQ group. He has served on the board of BAMEC, the Bay Area Municipal Elections Committee, which is the South Bay LGBTQ uh, Political Action Committee. And he's also active with the New Conservatory Theater Center, a queer San Francisco theater company, and other organizations. Bennett lives in Sunnyvale with his husband, Kim Harris, and their Norfolk Terrier, Edison. Welcome to Other Voices, Bennett, and thank you thank for you. Uh, joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I, I got a kick out of both of you making sure that your dogs got mentioned in, uh, in the bios, and I'm glad you uh, put your husbands up before the dogs <laughs> anyway. But, and and a, little, a little bit of trivia, Derek actually performed uh, Kim and Bennett's marriage. He oh, is that the, right? He oh. was the officiant for our marriage. Oh, that's great. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. Well, I, I'm glad to have you. I'm uh, really happy to meet you. And uh, let, let's get into this. Let's just start with the big question of your overall reaction to these new and disturbing trends in the uh, political world that are obviously having echoes and repercussions uh, throughout society. Um, I, I was saying before we went on the air, I don't recall ever seeing any presidential campaign, let alone one in which virtually all the, the candidates are running on a campaign of hate, unless you go back to 1968 and the George Wallace campaign, which was pretty blatantly racist. So here we are in 2023, and we're seeing a campaign like this. Uh, Craig, let's start with you, just because you've been on before. Um, your reaction to these trends, this overall wave of hate as part of a presidential campaign? Well, it's, it's really disturbing. It's really disturbing to see uh, the gains that we've made, not just for LGBTQ rights, but for people of color, um, for people with disabilities, for anybody who's different, um, seeing for immigrants, seeing these candidates make their campaigns all about hate of those folks. Uh, it's heartbreaking, but I think the main thing that that I take away from that is that the the other party, the Republican Party, I'm a Democrat, the Republican Party doesn't have anything concrete to really offer the American people that they could do better. Um, our economy has had a rough patch, but unemployment is at, you know a record low. Uh, inflation was bad, but it's coming down. Um, people's salaries are are increasing. Uh, the the environment is getting better in many places, except for these horrible wildfires. The the record of the Democrats is is pretty darn good for our lives. And so, what do the Republicans have to offer? But hate that we're going to go to a hell in a handbasket. Um, on the other hand, I'm I'm really hopeful that when I look at you say it's a presidential campaign fueled by hate. That's one side. That's 10, 14, 15, 16 candidates running for the nomination of a party that right now is all about hate. On the other side, we got Joe Biden lighting up the White House with rainbow colors, uh, celebrating pride on the White House lawn with people. Uh, he's he's not backing away at all in any way, shape or form from his support for LGBTQ people, for people of color, for uh, people that are you know coming to this country looking to make their lives better. So it, it, yes, it's a race where hate is fueling one side, and a few candidates on the Republican side are saying, "Oh, we're not quite like that. We're really uh, we're the moderate Republicans." But yeah. unless they're truly denouncing the hate that we're seeing from the other candidates, I'm sorry, they're all on the same page. Good point. Excellent point, Bennett. What's what's your uh, first take on this to share with our audience members? Well, I've been very, very alarmed by what I'm seeing. Uh, it's very clear to me um, that the Republicans have decided to scapegoat and demonize uh, LGBTQ people um, in exactly the way that Jews were de demonized uh, in early 1930s Germany. 
it's it's very clear a lot of the the language they're using a lot of the techniques they're using let's put up a list of crimes committed by these people without discussing any of the statistical implications or anything just upsetting people making them scared making them angry and and i should point out of course that in germany um transgender people and gay people were also uh demonized <laughs> so uh it's, in some ways it's familiar in many, many ways, it's familiar. And they're doing this, as, as Craig says, they don't really have a lot to offer the American people on the real problems that we face. Uh, so what they're doing is they're creating what's called a moral panic. They're creating a problem that you have to be scared of these transgender people. You have to be angry at them. They're after your kids, which is... In, uh, in Jewish history, it was called the blood libel, and it's, it's a familiar technique. And we're the only ones who can save you from this danger that we're making up. And the reason that they're focusing on transgender people this time around, I think, is because uh, that most people in the country have the least knowledge about transgender people as opposed to gay people. There are fewer of them. They haven't made quite the progress that gay people made for a while. And people are, are very confused or ignorant. And in many cases, the first thing that they'll ever hear about a transgender person is the lies that are coming from Republican officials, most of whom know better, some of whom don't. Um, and the whole point here is if you can create a panic and then say you're the only ones who can solve it, uh, then they'll give you money and votes. And uh, now it's inevitable that people's lives will be ruined. And as much as I hate to say it, we're seeing violence already, and it may get worse. Um, and that is somewhere between an acceptable cost and the cherry on the top of the Sunday for them. And they really do not care. Um, now, the Democrats overall, uh, Craig is absolutely right. We just had pride on the White House lawn. And uh, I'm very pleased that there are few, if any, Democrats who are backing away at this point. Uh, I think they realize that it wouldn't really do them much good. Um, but the thing I would like to see is maybe not Joe Biden, but somebody in the, the Democratic Party who has a big megaphone to really be a pit bull on this stuff, to not just say we honor and love our LGBTQ people, but to say they're lying to you. Here's the truth. This is what we support, a counter narrative. And we're not seeing anybody with uh, a wide communicative reach right now, a national communicative reach actually doing that work. That that's a good point. My uh, my next question on my list here was uh, how do we counter this? And that's that's a very excellent strategy to have a well-known voice out there who kind of takes it on for themselves to uh, to be that that counterweight to this. And um, as much as Pride Month has been uh, appropriately uh, celebrated uh, among various Democratic politicians. I wonder what the fight back will be in July and August and next January and February. That's that's what we're talking about is the, the problem here is this is going to be sustained over the next year at least. Greg, thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with Bennett. And I hadn't th really thought about it. But yeah, we're not seeing any major national voices taking this on uh, other, you know, than uh, grassroots folks like us. Um, but that's often where this kind of thing starts. Uh, it does. At the grassroots. It does. And I think in the transgender attacks, the people we need to hear from are more of the parents of people who are trans especially parents of, of young people who are trans. The, and, and I have heard some of those voices and they, they have been very compelling and they have spoken out on television and at PTA groups and in front of their city councils um, and in front of school boards. We need more of that. We have a, an ability to amplify when we find those voices and make sure that they get echoed and shared as widely as possible. 
Um, but the, the the tough thing for me is when whatever group you belong to, whatever marginalized group you belong to, when someone is attacking someone else in a marginalized group, you need to stand up. And that's what we need to call on people to do. The Congressional Black Caucus, for example. Um, you need to stand up and say, when you attack them, I know you're attacking me because you're just trying to divide us. Uh, the Rainbow Coalition, the idea of that is really critical for each of us to stand up when we see somebody being marginalized, somebody being injured, somebody being killed because of who they are. We have to all stand up and say that's not acceptable. The the loss of, of Roe v. Wade, um, it, it's really important that LGBTQ people recognize and speak out and say, what just happened to women is a tragedy, not just for women, it's a tragedy for all of us, especially if you just do a little bit of hunting, you're going to find out, you're going to see that as soon as Roe v. Wade was overturned, Republican operatives got together and said, oh my God, we just lost a, a critical wedge issue that helps us make money and gets us votes. What are we going to do? And the answer they came up with was, let's go after the gays. You know, in particular states, there were there were governors, there were attorneys general, uh, Paxton, for example, who's being impeached right now. First thing out of Paxton's mouth when Roe v. Wade went down, the very next day, what he said was, oh, good, now we can go after sodomy laws and we can get LGBTQ people put back in the closet. You know, and then there were people across the country, Republican operatives, who said, that's going to be the issue that we tackle, that we fight on next. That's how we're going to get people to come to our side. Now that, we, now that we've given them Roe v. Wade, now that that's not an issue anymore, uh, here's what we got to do. And it's been clear in this last year, the attacks have ramped up dramatically. So we, all people who are marginalized, need to step up and look, at, look around and realize that we're bigger, we're stronger, we're better able to help each other if we stand up for each other. And, and Ben, it's right. We're not seeing that on a national scale like we should. Yeah, we need to uh, make alliances across a lot of uh, traditional communities that have been somewhat isolated from each other. Um, you're reminding me about what Paxton said uh, shortly after uh, the Dobbs decision on, on Roe v. Wade. Is there anything in the court systems right now that directly challenges uh, same-sex marriage, for example? Is there anything starting to work its way through? Uh, right now, the only thing I can think of is there's one case, Bennett, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's kind of like a masterpiece cake uh, case that's making its way forward as to whether or not, I think it's a woman who builds websites for a living and yeah. she sued over the idea that she might not be, be able to say no to a, a gay marriage website, even though she doesn't make those right now. That particular case, I think, is working its way to the Supreme Court. Uh, that, Bennett, that's you know to be this? decided this year, I think. That... Yeah, no, it's very clear that the court is enormously sympathetic to giving rights to conventionally religious, right-wing religious people at the cost of marginalized communities and everyone else. And they're, you know, I think they're just this close to throwing out all gay rights laws because they infringe upon other people's religions, uh, their, their religious right to, to be really mean and cruel, um, which right. one would hope would not be considered a religious right, but there it is. Uh, and so I'm I'm very uh, worried also about just the the gay civil rights laws. You know, it's interesting. In around 1967, there was a Supreme Court case where uh, a man who owned a pork restaurant said, um, "Well, I can't integrate my restaurant because God doesn't want me to." And that was a very popular and common opinion among right wing Christians at the time. I mean, the history, they keep saying this is different, but it's no different from when they were supporting segregation, uh, when they were oppressing Jews, when they were oppressing women. It's just a new target. And uh, he took it to the court then and said, I, I can't, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sell them uh, pork, you know, out the window, but they, I can't integrate my, um, my restaurant because of the... Uh, uh, um, because of my religious beliefs. Liberty. And um, 
the court said, I believe unanimously, although I'm not sure, um, no, sorry, you can have what religious beliefs you want, but this is a valid law and you can't. The 1964 civil rights law is a valid law and um, you can't violate it on the basis of your religion. I am not the least bit sure that um, the court we have now would agree with that finding. Yeah. Particularly when it comes to gays. This this uh, current Supreme Court is is pretty scary. I, I want to turn to one of the effects of one of the more disturbing effects of uh, this campaign, this hate campaign, as uh, you rightfully describe it. It just happened that um, today uh, a, a new uh, collaboration between the anti defamation leg, which has been tracking anti-Semitic uh, occurrences um, for a long, long time, and GLAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance for, um, I'm forgetting what GLAD. Against defamation. Against defamation, yeah, thank you. They, they just re released a report as of this morning uh, talking about this very subject. And let me just hit a couple of these highlights and then get your comments. From June, or lowlights, I should call them, from June 2022 to April 2023, that's 10 months we're talking about, ADL and GLAD tracked at least 356 in incidents of anti-LGBTQ -LG plus hate and extremism in the United States. Uh, nearly half of these incidents, 49%, so it's about 50-50, were perpetrated wholly or substantially by individuals associated with ex extremist groups, meaning like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. And incidents were documented in 46 states, and interestingly, the uh, top states, and this probably has a lot to do with population, but it starts with California, Florida, New York, and Texas had saw the highest total number of incidents. And these are harassments, vandalism, outright assault. Um, it, it, it varies, but 365 documented incidents in 10 months, 356, I'm sorry, um, is, is pretty alarming. Uh, because that's kind of the period we're talking about when this national campaign of hate has really kicked into gear. Right. So let me just turn to both of you in turn. What what are your reactions to seeing these these numbers that I don't think we had seen anything quite like this before this report? Well, well I'd start. I'm, Go ahead, Bennett. I'm I'm glad for one thing that the ADL and and GLAD are working together. That is the start of some sort of coalition. That is yes. good to see. And as a Jewish person, I have to say that I do not believe they're going to stop with LGBTQ people, which would be bad enough for me. They've got a list, you know, and and, and it's the people who have commonly been oppressed. Uh, you can go after them, or that people believe lies about. Uh, I think one thing that's that's important for me to note, at least when I think about this, is that I think the uh, the administrative term of the former president um, really empowered uh, hatred and slurs and a tendency toward violence. It's in all their rhetoric. They have tremendously violent rhetoric. And that, of course, spills over. There's this concept called stochastic terrorism, where if you just put the message out enough, some people will pick up on it and, and take it to extremes. And you can say, oh, that's not what I meant. But it is. And you're not taking care to have it not uh, seen that way. And um, I something that really just because it's so, so of course the Proud Boys and all that stuff, they're, they're very active now and they're going after drag shows and they're going after Pride and, and they're organized now. And that all happened under the former president because of his rhetoric, because of his policies, because of who loved him and who he loved, which are not a, a basket full of deplorables, let us say, to use a phrase. Um, something that I saw that just, 
made me shiver was when this ridiculous controversy over Bud Light became national news, even though it took place in Canada. And, and they were just making a little deal with an influencer who was not important. And they turned it into a national issue because they have Fox News to do that for them. Um, one thing I saw was people videoing themselves, putting up cans of Bud Light and shooting them with rifles. Jeez. And uh, I, you know, the, the message there is pretty clear. The danger there is pretty clear. Uh, and there are people out there, I guarantee, who think, well, we don't have to stop with the beer cans. And uh, we've, heard, we've heard violent, a lot of violent rhetoric from some highly placed people. And uh, my fear is that it'll turn into violence. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, going back to this uh, ADL GLAD report, keeping in mind that half the attacks uh, came from organized groups. The other half came from people like you're talking about who were just inspired or revved up by uh, this hateful rhetoric that, that's being spewed around. Craig, do you have anything you want to add on this? Yeah, I, well, it, 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 they've, in, they've emboldened hateful people uh, and they've given them the, the ammunition, so to speak, that they need to vent their hate. Uh, most are going to vent it with words uh, and some are going to vent it with actual violence. We had a, uh, I had a pride display a display outside of our shop in San Carlos, and you know Bay Area is a pretty progressive place. And even if you weren't progressive, you, you would think that you wouldn't want to be extremely loud about your hate. Yet I had somebody walk by the shop, two men, uh, around ten thirty in the morning. I had my display out there, and one looked to the other and very loudly shouted. Why do they have to shove this shit down everybody's throats? And the other person didn't, you know, shrink away and say, "Ooh, watch what you say." He just, "Yep, yep." Uh huh. And this was on a busy street in San Carlos, California. So they're they're not trying to hide it, and the language that they're using is the language that they're getting from Fox News, from Newsmax, Newsmax, from OAN. Uh, some number of months ago, uh, the Redwood City Library had a drag story time. And I found out that a local minister was organizing a protest against that story time. And I called and I spoke with that minister uh, to try to understand his perspective. And everything that he said to me were the talking points straight out of Fox News, OAN and Newsmax, all wrong, uh, all stupid, but these were you know, his positions. And uh, I asked him what he was planning to do when he came to the protest. And he said, oh, I'm just planning on, you know, just being silent and protesting that way. And I asked, well, what kind of sign are you going to bring? Because I figured he's going to bring a sign. He said, no, the only sign will be my two hands held in front of me in prayer. And I told him that I would join him uh, at the library if that was what he was going to do with my hands in prayer along with him. Um, the day of that drag story time, Around 20-something protesters showed up. He didn't. <laughs> Their signs were pretty awful and hateful. I spoke to as many of them as I could. They all parroted the talking points that you get from the right-wing news channels. Um, and then I went in. We had about maybe 50 or 60 people that came to support the story time. So it was a peaceful gathering. And there were enough people to make sure these 20 protesters didn't make too much of a fuss. As the story time started, the performer was dressed in this incredibly beautiful Mayan princess uh, garment. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that folks had said to me is, oh, it's going to be overly sexual and she's going to show her breasts and her genitals. And, and that the just poor children are going to see these things. Well, no, she was wearing this beautiful flowing white gown that covered almost everything. It was almost as though she was Muslim. You know, was this herself. really the impression that the protesters had of what goes on at Drag this this was time? this was what they expected, and and about six different people each tried to say, "Here, let me show you this video that I found on the internet of this horrible drag show." And I kept saying, "I don't want to see your video from the internet. Let's just watch what happens here." 
Right. So as the performance was happening, this Mayan princess uh, was reading uh, at one point Marlon Bundo, the uh, the parody of uh, Vice President Pence's uh, rabbit, pet <laughs> rabbit. It was really cute. The kids were laughing. The parents were having a good time. And there's this woman protester sobbing uncontrollably. And one of the librarians said, Craig, can you go and talk to her? So I went over and I said, you know, what's wrong? What's going on? She said, can't you see what's happening? And she's crying. She's literally crying. Can't you see what's happening? He's sexualizing these poor babies. And I, I looked at her and said, he's reading a children's book about a bunny. And she <laughs> said, but but he's sexualizing them. He's, he's grooming them. So I, I tried to ask her, could we go outside and talk? Because she was starting to disrupt the event. And I got surrounded by a bunch of the protesters who told me to back the blank off that she was allowed to stand there and cry. I backed off. About 10 minutes later, she came up to me again, still with the tears running. And she said, can't you see what's happening? Can't you see what he's doing to those poor children? And they're just all sitting on the floor and laughing at whatever he was reading. And I, I looked at her and said, no, I, I really can't. She said, do you think there's something wrong with me? And I said, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I really do. I, you know, I think she'd been programmed to see, we're sitting there seeing the same thing, watching the same thing, yet she's seeing something completely different. In a way, it's kind of cult-like. It's like she's being brainwashed. And, uh, you know, the, the, the event went fine. Nobody got hurt. Uh, the protesters left eventually. But when I called Derek, my husband, to tell him I was on my way home, he almost cried because he was terrified that something terrible was going to happen to me and the people at that library in Redwood City because of the kind of rhetoric that is being used about something as simple as somebody dressing up cute for a story time. So, you know, it, it, I'm, I, I you know, agree with Bennett. Um, I, I'm afraid and we should be afraid because the kinds of messages that they're sending, Pizzagate, that there are pedophiles sucking the blood of children in the basement of a pizza parlor in New York caused somebody to run into that pizza parlor that didn't have a basement with a gun and threaten people. Yeah. And and we have, as I mentioned earlier, over a year more of this to go uh, with, with this campaign. I want to turn briefly to the, the question I raised at the beginning uh, about uh, some growing corporate, especially consumer products, uh, support or at least recognition of, of gay pride. Uh, Bennett mentioned the uh, the Budweiser case, um, and I hadn't heard about that shooting the the cans thing. But with an AR-15, pardon? With an AR-15? Uh, uh, oh, of course. Uh, but um, I found an article um, from on the BBC of all things that uh, Bud Light has actually gone since that incident from the best-selling beer in the U.S., uh, it has, it, their sales have dropped 25% yes. since uh, that, that incident. And uh, this article also mentions that a, a marketing agency did a survey and said that 67% of Americans say their purchases are affected by a brand stance while 42% say they have stopped shopping with a particular brand. So because of its uh, position on, on some issue or, or other. Um, what are we to make of places like Target and Budweiser and these other large corporations um, putting uh, rainbow flags on their advertising and, and doing special Pride Month displays and then backing off if, if somebody uh, criticizes or, or raises a dispute. And of course, the other 11 months of the year, they don't seem to be there at all. <laughs> I, I take it, first of all, that you know a place like Target putting up um, pride displays is, is a sign that the activism of folks like uh, you two is taking an effect, that they're, they're willing to recognize pride and the, the community is a major part of their uh, their public. Can I just get your reactions on 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 this? It's it's something that's becoming more and more prominent. 
uh, going beyond the advertising pages to where they are now incurring uh, flack from this, this hate campaign, now directed at Budweiser, the favorite drink of a lot of people, and uh, places like Target. Thoughts on this? Bennett, you want to start? Yeah, I do, because I've been involved in the corporate side of gay rights issues for a long time, and it's where I sort of made my mark. Um, you know, there's a constant discussion about pinkwashing. You know, they're putting up rainbow stuff, but they're only doing that because they think it will earn them money from the gay community and not lose the money from anybody else. They have no beliefs, they have no sincerity, and they'll contribute to to you know Republican candidates, and um, th so it's just PR with no feeling behind it. Now, having been in corporations and having worked with them on getting these things done, um, I think that that's an oversimplification because there are a lot of people who are making the decision, um, and some of those people are gay or are trans. And some of those people are really, really strong allies. And some of those people are bean counters and are only concerned about the bottom line. Now, unfortunately, we have descended so far into a culture that says that the only thing a corporation should do is maximize its profits. The idea of being a good corporate citizen is, is just not discussed anymore, really. Uh, as a goal for a corporation. They're supposed to make their shareholders money. That's it. And so it's hard to fight with the bean counters. And it's hard to fight with the 25% loss. It really is. And so even people, even if there are people in the company, even medium level people in the company who want to fight back against the hatred, they have to deal with everybody else. And right now, it looks to me like in many companies, they'd lose. Uh, and in some companies, they would not. Ben and Jerry's is not going to back away. Right. Um, so that is what I see. The other question is whether there's any value to the gay community that these corporations do this if they are not, even if they're not sincere. I think it's a good measuring stick of how far we've come, for one thing, that they actually think that it might help them. You know, they didn't used to think that. They used right. to think that it would destroy them. And now people are trying to bring that back um, as uh, um, something that they should learn. I, I see notes on the internet where people said, look, Bud Light has learned their lesson and now all the other companies will too. The other thing I'll mention about it is that um, they can to some extent shrug off some of this stuff, but when it turns into people coming into the store and threatening the staff, knocking over displays, right. uh, death threats on the phone, that kind of stuff. Even if I were running a company, I don't know what I would do at that point. We'd like to say we don't negotiate with terrorists, but in fact, we have to, we, we have to worry about things. And yeah, you, have, you have a responsibility to your employees, yeah. their physical um, safety. I would say, and this shows my my white privilege, <laughs> very much so. Um, you know, you get death threats. You get people coming in and and threatening your employees. You get people knocking things over. Go to the authorities. Make sure that there's a record of it. Ha try to pressure them into responding. Now we see a lot of places where the police are there and they're they're not doing a thing. They're smiling. Um, but uh, I would say then go to the feds, do something, make it very public that you're getting death threats and, and, and make it clear and make it unarguable. And some people will go, that's too far. Other people would go, I don't really care. Um, and by the way, I have to say what Craig described outside the library is horrible enough. But in the places where the Proud Boys are showing up with guns on their shoulders to protest Drag Queen Story Hour, when I think of the trauma that that inflicts on the children, the actual real trauma that that inflicts on the children, 
as opposed to this fantasy imaginary paranoid trauma that having a drag queen read to them is going to groom them sexually or whatever. Um, it really makes me sick, sad and sick. I think the only thing that I would add to the conversation on, on corporations and businesses is that businesses that truly have a culture of being inclusive and welcoming of all people, businesses that say, we want everybody to be able to enjoy our brand, uh, they're not going to run away. Uh, if it's truly part of their corporate culture that they are inclusive and welcoming and that's what they do, like, like Apple, for example, they're not going to back off. Uh, from this. And there are many companies that have been truly inclusive for years and they're not backing off. And despite the idiotic phrase, go woke and go broke, the truth is that companies that are more inclusive, companies that are more social justice oriented, companies that do show that they care about people on the planet, those companies are making money and they're making more money and they're successful. And an excellent point. And on that point, I will um, turn to our audience members here and uh, invite them in with uh, your questions and, and comments. There's two ways you can do this. One, we like to hear your questions. So if you're willing to talk into your microphone, you won't be on camera, select the raise hand and our director, David Simon, who's working behind the scenes, will uh, you'll get a message to unmute yourself and then just ask your question. The other way you can do it is click on the Q&A button at the bottom and type in your question and I will read one, uh, read off the, the question. So let me see if we've got any hands coming up here. We do have one hand coming up. So while David gets that on, I've um, go ahead and bring uh, Lynn on if you would. And we, oh, the written question is from Lynn also. So maybe I will uh, just wait for Lynn to um, come on. Did Do you guys see the very violent protest in Glendale a couple of weeks ago? Um, the uh, Board of Education was deciding about having LGBTQI plus um, a curriculum in the schools and about 500 MAGA folks came and the Glendale police were sort of outnumbered. And one person took TikTok videos. So if you go to, I mean, um, Twitter videos, if you Google it, you can see these videos. This guy took about eight videos. He was even in the crowd where they were physically attacking uh, gay people. Um, and there was even a minister standing with somebody strong uh, as support, but the violence was unbelievable. And my question is, I'm going to see these people going to the uh, internet and seeing the agenda of these uh, organizations, school, and, and, and this is their uh, regular attack on um, civil rights like that. What do you think about that? Great. Well, I think Bennett, Bennett said it right. Um, we need to demand that people who commit acts of violence, harassment, uh, need to be prosecuted. And if our local uh, sheriffs or our local police departments or local district attorneys are not doing that, uh, we have to replace them. Okay, Bennett, anything you want to add to that? or Just there that there comes a point where we have to call this domestic terrorism. That's what it is. When they start calling in bomb threats, when they start like shoving people on the street in a crowd of 500, all that kind of stuff, that is... and. As Craig said, they have this language now that is just so rigid and it's it's like a, a, a religious dogma. They're just repeating lines that might as well be in Latin. Go broke, go woke, go broke, and, and the agenda and shoving it down our throats and um, uh, groomers and all that. They don't have an original thought on this. I'm sure they are people who are capable of having original thoughts, but they've abandoned that. And they don't have an original thought on this. And it's very, very hard to get through to people who just keep repeating uh, phrases. Can you still hear me? Yes, go ahead, Lynn. Um, they were wearing t-shirts that said, leave my child alone. Right. Again, right. it's this ridiculous um, 
fear, <laughs> unsubstantiated fear that uh, gay people, trans, that they're going to brainwash children. And actually, it's more straight people that attack children. I, I always say that they're the ones that are grooming their children. They're grooming their, their gay children and their trans children to hate themselves. And they're grooming their straight children to be bullies. And who's served by them? Yeah. Good point. Good point. So uh, I don't see any other hands up right now. Oh, I have a hand up here in my, my living room. Why don't you come over here and ask your question? This is my partner, Steffi. Okay. Well, first of all, um, it is scary to see all of this hate being mobilized and mobilized for political ends. And I surely agree with what you said also about our responsibility to stand up against it, to insist that um, people who are violent or intimidating um, receive attention from the authorities on that. Mm -hmm. But I also want to say, I, I loved your story, Craig, about what happened in Redwood City for the most part, except the woman who was sobbing because of her cult <laughs> beliefs. But, um, and you also mentioned the parents have to speak up. I am amazed at hearing so many kids speaking up. Yeah. And even, you know, I'm not a big consumer of popular media, but I am seeing on the local news, and just last night on Channel 2, they did a beautiful and lengthy segment on a kid calls himself, herself, Hendrix, a trans girl. Oh, she might be five years old. She was speaking about how she felt about things, and she was great. I mean, this is a little kid. Yeah, I think she was eight, but still. I, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, but she was clear well before she was five who she was, and her parents backed her up. And so her parents yeah. were interviewed as well, and she was speaking for herself. And this is not the first thing that I've seen while looking at the local news where somebody who's not even old enough to vote is saying, I'm here and you have to just let me, you know, let me be. I, what Lynn said about the um, leave my kids alone, I, I agree with you, Bennett, that um, the people who should be leaving kids alone are the people who are trying to intimidate gay trans kids. And so I guess I want to just hear your thoughts about how we can do more to amplify the voices of young people because they're out there and in their schools, they have gay straight alliances, they are resources to each other. How do we back them up and help them stay as safe as possible? They're doing very brave things. So let me, uh, Thank you. yeah, let me uh, say, I'm on the San Mateo County LGBTQ Commission. We've done a lot of great things in the last eight, nine years. This year, we've decided that one of the things we want to focus on is listening. And so our intention is to go out to the GSAs and other youth groups and simply say, here's who we are. Here's what we do. We're your government. We are your government. And here's an opportunity. We want you to tell us what you want us to do to help you amplify your voices. Yeah. The key message that I would give to the people that, that hate and that are scared and that are trying to fight us is you guys have already lost. You may not realize it, but you've already lost. The percentage of young people who identify somewhere as LGBTQIA+, who don't want to check a particular box for their gender, who want the freedom to be who they are, that number is huge yeah. and it's growing. Yeah. And the, the haters... The, the 50 some odd somethings, the 60 somethings, the 70 somethings, grandpa sitting around watching Fox and falling asleep. You've already lost. You just haven't realized it yet. And we just haven't gotten to the point where we need to get to. Uh, another quick thing that I would say to everybody that's watching um, here in San Mateo County and in Santa Clara County, just about every city in town has raised the pride flag and kept it up this entire month. Your city councils, your county supervisors need to hear from you saying thank you. They hear from you all the time when you're pissed off about something. <laughs> but right now in this area of California, they're all doing the right thing. They're all standing up for LGBTQIA plus people. And they even celebrated Juneteenth in a lot of places, a great thing that we're having them do. So reach out to your city council, to your county supervisors, and tell them thank you. 
tell them that you see what they're doing and you're glad and you back them up and you support them. Thank you. Bennett, anything to add on reaching youth and empowering youth to uh, continue on their, their uh, ally path? Bennett looks frozen. I think we have a Zoom freeze there. Oh, that's okay. too bad. And I was going to ask him about uh, his his background in doing some important work inside the uh, Silicon Valley uh, corporations. Yeah, maybe he'll be able to connect back in. We'll see if yeah, he comes zooms back in. Hopefully, he would have heard what I what I was just saying. I do want yeah. to mention that um, I I don't see any other hands up. We have. One, uh, not a question in the Q&A queue, but I'll pass this along. Joan says, just want to say thank you to all three of you. So thank, thank you for you. that, Joan. It's important to say thanks, as Craig just mentioned. Yeah. So um, Craig, you just mentioned uh, basically what the the commission in San Mateo is, is up to. Yeah. Anything else going on? Uh, just, uh, you know, we're laser focused on any legislation that's happening here in California. I'm really proud that the state of California, with the support of our county supervisors and our, our local governments, is a sanctuary state for trans uh, children and their parents. If you're in another state that has passed laws making it illegal to provide gender affirming care, some of those states have also passed laws that make it a crime to leave the state and go to another state for that care. So California now has a law that basically says we will not enforce another state's anti-trans laws. If parents and children want to come here for the care that they need, uh, if they get prosecuted in their home states and they try to uh, extradite them from California, it ain't going to happen. And there are organizations around California that are also helping by providing uh, funds and services for parents uh, and children leaving those states. Uh, I'm really proud of the state for doing that. Um, and the county was uh, deeply involved in urging and encouraging the state to pass that law, and Governor Newsom was proud to sign it. That's excellent. Excellent news. Um, any events of note coming up? I know the um, San Francisco Pride Parade, uh, the celebration is all weekend. The parade is, is on Sunday. Are there uh, other local events down here that people should know about or can connect with? There's, there's not a heck of a lot of month left but right exactly so i think most most of the cities and towns uh kind of back off uh do their things before san francisco has its pride event to give it the big bang uh there have been pride festivals uh in many cities uh in santa clara and san mateo county i think they're mostly done the san mateo county fair has a pride day and they've had that for the last few years then it's coming back good um and every single city and town in san mateo county raised the pride flag and kept that pride flag going and did proclamations and did public events. Um, so I'm just really proud of what's happening here. Uh, and uh, next year, uh, in June, there'll be more celebrations. Uh, coming up in the fall, there'll be um, Transgender Day of Remembrance gatherings. And so watch uh, the San Mateo County Pride Center's website for that. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to recognize the horrible toll that violence takes on transgender people across this country. And so we will uh, lift up the names of those who have been uh, injured and killed and uh, continue our work to make sure that, that that doesn't happen. Bennett, I'm glad you made it back because- Yeah, um, sorry about that. That's okay, Zoom freezes happen. Right. Um, I had wanted to pursue some of your history in, in organizing for recognition and uh, equal benefits and things like that in uh, a lot of the Silicon Valley corporations. Can, can you give us kind of a summary of what it was like back in the 80s starting that work and how things are, are now? We've only got three or four minutes left here, but. Yeah, I, in 1986, I started Apple Lambda as a sort of act of will. Um, there were other companies that had gay and lesbian employee groups, but they tended to be networking groups and social groups. And I decided that at Apple, we were gonna work with the company openly and out loud, and we were gonna change policy. There may have been some other groups doing that, but I didn't see much of them. And um, we put together 
me and, and the rest of them put together a great group. And we worked with the company and the company was very encouraging. Not when I started it, they were leery when I started it, but once it got moving, they were very encouraging and they worked with us. We got a non-discrimination policy. We, um, we got domestic partner benefits and then we went on to do other things. And I worked with people at other companies sort of to show them what our model was. Every company's different, they've got to do their own. My husband was at Hewlett Packard, which was much more conservative than Apple. But it was very scary. I, used, I wasn't out of the closet, except to selected individuals who weren't allowed to tell anybody else at work. And th by doing this, I came out publicly to the entire company and I was really scared. And the second I did it, I felt this enormous sense of relief mm -hmm. and thought, if any, everyone knows I'm gay now, I don't have to worry about who knows and who doesn't. <laughs> and if they're gonna do anything wrong, it's gonna be their problem and not my problem. I wanna give you a little bit of a story from the early nineties, which is that we got domestic partner benefits and then Apple was gonna open a site in Texas. I think it was Austin. And normally when a company, a big successful company does that, they give them some tax breaks. And the Austin, the, the city council, whatever city it was, didn't want to do that because we were being nice to our gay people. Uh, it's sort of like what you're seeing today. Wow. Um, they made up the most ridiculous reasons about how, well, you're going to have now more gay people in the company because of your policies and they're all going to get AIDS and then they're going to fall on us. And it was insane what they made up. But what they really meant was you're nice to gay people and we're, we're not comfortable with it. You know, when white people used to be friendly with black people or supportive of black civil rights, there was a term that was used and that I can't repeat, end lover, but I can't repeat the actual term. And it was very effective. People were scared to be called that and they could get a lot of pushback if they were seen that way. Now on the internet, I see people saying of Disney, well, they're gay supporters and that's it. That's all they feel they need to say. Yeah. to say we can't have anything to do with them. Okay, well, we are yeah. almost out of time and I, I really want to be sure to slip this in. Uh, Bennett, tell us what your shirt says and, and what it means. <laughs> um, my shirt says Friends of Dorothy. I picked it up uh, at the... Um, uh, San Francisco production of The Wizard of Oz the other day, which which was a wonderful production and pretty queer, <laughs> and very San Francisco. Um, in the 50s and the 60s, gay people who could not come out, who could lose their jobs and their homes and their freedom and wind up in prison or hospital, but still had to find each other, had ways. And one of the phrases that was used that day, those days, was to say to somebody, I'm a friend of Dorothy. Um, and, and gay people understood what that meant. So it was useful. Uh, interestingly, at that time, when they were, uh, particularly during the McCarthy years, when they were cracking down on gays in, secretly in the military, they heard about gays saying to each other, I'm a friend of Dorothy. And the military uh, officials thought, that there was an actual person named Dorothy who all these people were friends with and who was sort of organizing all the gay people and lesbian people in the military. <laughs> and um, that was, you know, well, when you're living a secret of life, when you have to live a secret of life, you've got your own code words, you've got your own clothes, you've got your own everything. And I'm glad that we've come some distance from then. Although sometimes it's nice to look back on it and think how cute we were. <laughs> very, very cute. Very, Greg, very cute. any closing words? Sure. Uh, you know, we're talking about corporations and businesses and, and reaching out to LGBT people, trying to sell to people. To me, one of the biggest delights in my store is when a kid and a parent or a grandparent walk into the store and the kid spots our display of flags, pride flags of all kinds, and a look of delight lights up on that kid's face. And that kid is so comfortable and so loved 
that they're able to grab one of those flags and say, ma, grandma, uncle, look, look, they have the flags here. And the parents would be like, oh, that's great. Yeah, do you want one? To see that delight, to see that love between a child and a trusting, loving adult, uh, it makes me so happy and so joyful. And it tells me that we're on the way to a much better place. And so if you are a company and you really do love people and the planet um, and you're working for a better future for the world, don't be shy about it. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Go ahead and do what you really believe and the people will follow you and they will support you and you will thrive. Bennett, closing remarks, anything? Just um, this is a, a dangerous time, a frightening time. And as Craig has said, we have to form coalitions. We have to get our ally. I, I saw a line the other day that said, if you're an ally to a marginalized community and you're not getting hit by the stones that people are throwing at them, you're not standing close enough. And I thought that was a little harsh thing to say to somebody who wants to be an ally, but we really need to energize our allies to, as Craig says, call the politicians, call the stores that do this. The other side is very, very well organized. And uh, we're Democrats, you know? <laughs> so we, we, we tend to just like try to do the right thing from day to day and, and, and we don't focus enough on, on really clear threats. So we need, really need to do that. Good, good thoughts to close on. Craig Wiesner, Bennett Marks, thank you both so much for your, your time and your knowledge and uh, your deep commitment and, and caring for, for people.